Additional questions before we go to public comment? And then we'll come back to council after that. Council member Rosenberger, is that a hand or? Yeah, I'm hesitant, but I, I, um, I guess, I mean, I, I want to talk about transportation demand management a little more. I'm sorry for all this, but I, I wanted to ask, did we consult the consultant who did the TDM plan about where we should house this? And following up on that, I, I just did a lot of looking at different cities uh, that are similar to us. Not only do they have transportation departments that stand alone, they have TDM housed in a transportation department. So, and I mean, on, on those websites, it was just so easy to get information because I could type in something like transportation and find everything I needed. So just wondering if we asked the consultant about that. And I think I would just like to ask, this is kind of a hot topic. And in the beginning, the, the mayor said, that TDM, this TDM position fit in both departments. So maybe I would like to hear why it also fits well in planning and transportation and if this move would be considered. So I'm, I, I'm sorry, uh, what was the, is the question about whether the move would be considered or is the question about the uh, the, the place the current proposed place. Councilmember Rosenberger, I'm happy to, I, when I said it could be in either place, uh, we had a lot of discussion and Mr. Robinson may want to step in if he wants to, which is fine. It could fit in either place. Um, there are pluses and minuses. Um, I think as I tried to do in my too long opening statement, uh, explain that um, in essence, uh, look, I am deeply committed to accomplishing the results and delivering the results of the transportation demand plan, uh, which is not easy to do, and trying to figure out how do we best accomplish that. And uh, uh, I am perfectly willing and think it's great to be held accountable. To, are we accomplishing those objectives? Uh, I think from my assessment and talking with our leadership and things on their plates and relationships that they have, it's my assessment that the best way to actually get the results that we want from a TDM position uh, in terms of uh, marketing and outreach to the private sector employers. Uh, for example, we did that as we had to close the four street garage, working with them to try to reduce their need for parking in the interim. Uh, that kind of uh, relationship in improving commuting incentives and improving uh, programs that employers may do, that that's most likely to be most successful if we launch it in ESD. And I perfectly respect that you may have a different view on that uh, and others may too. Um, but I guess uh, from my perspective, um, if, if you wanna fund a TDM program, I'd ask you to let the administration accomplish those objectives uh, as effectively as we can and hold us accountable for whether we get the results done or not, uh, rather than analyze who reports to whom uh, in, in the structure. But, but I, again, it's certainly a reasonable position uh, planning was important in the development of the TDM uh, position, but in terms of executing it and delivering and getting the results of increasing the numbers of employers who have those programs, um, we think launching it here is more effective. Additional questions? Okay. And while you're thinking about that, members of the public, um, if you have an interest in offering comment on Ordinance 2023, you may want to use, start using the raise hand function um, it, or type into chat, and we'll be getting to that as soon as we finish with council questions. Uh, council Member Flaherty. Sure. Thanks. Uh, between the budget hearings in August and now, have there been any changes to the budget a proposal that are a result of council member concerns and requests for a change? That's the full question. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we talked about um, police department changes, uh, proposals was the main one uh, in terms of, um, and of course the police department recommendations varied quite a bit. There were there were a number of uh, different re recommendations on what to do in connection with the police department. That would be the 
I think the major um, change, Mr. Underwood may reflect some, some minor um, uh, monetary changes. Um, I think the two, the two, some views about not having an engineering department or about where TDM ought to be placed. Uh, I, I give you my explanations on that. I think it's probably <clears throat> relevant to um, uh, uh, note as well that the, the potential changes um, in implementing the budget in 2021, depending upon revenue, I, I, we haven't taken any action on those, but those I wanted to give a heads up on some of the pressures that I think are, are uh, built into the budget as it stands. Um, but we didn't change the numbers due to that. Thanks, and, and I understand um, and I appreciate the comments at the beginning uh, of the evening about the administration's position regarding uh, various, um, you know, series or themes in the questions that emerged from council. But uh, on the police, I, I realize there are changes to police uh, policing and how we structure policing and new positions added this year. So those are changes as a changes from last year. But I guess more specifically, the, what I meant in my question was between the proposal that we heard at the budget hearings in August and now, have there been any changes? Um, uh, and I, I, I guess I feel like um, maybe your initial uh, remarks, Mayor Hamilton, um, were responsive to a, diff a different question, if that makes sense. Well, maybe I didn't follow it exactly. Um, we, with the 140 questions that we got, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm not really aware of substantial recommendations outside of that. If, if, if you're asking about responses to council member um, requests, uh, th those that we got that, that I think were substantial. And again, I'm sorry if I'm missing some of the 142 questions. Uh, most of those were really about information, but the suggestions really, as I tried to identify them, came out to those three main questions about engineering, uh, T TDM location for both of those, and then various aspects of the police budget. And I would say that some of the things I talked about tonight with regard to police planning and, and proposals for 2021, including the uh, talking about that community-based um, committee and where it ought to be located and how to do it. I proposed something in July. We've talked about it, and there's still kind of different ideas uh, responding to different ideas about that. Uh, and then the um, ideas of potential uh, other actions that could be taken in connection with the police force, particularly sworn officers that may help uh, produce a better police department in 2021. Those are actions that directly resulted from conversations with council members and the public. But those, those three areas, if there are areas besides that, that, that we have missed, I'm certainly welcome to hear those too. Okay, thank you. Is the chair frozen? Uh, Mr. Sims, I think that you have the helm until she unfreezes. Okay, do we have any more? Can you hear me? Thank you. Until she comes back, do we have any more council comments before we go to the public? Okay, seeing none, uh, Clerk Bowden, do we have any? public comments. I see five, I think, on a raised hand. You're muted. Sorry. That's first okay. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> first up is Randy Paul. And Mr. Paul, if you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Okay, thank you. Yes. I just want to make a comment. Um, I comment on the exchange that Alex Crowley and Council Member, Member Smith had, and it's a continued concern I have where we're using the pandemic as a reason to back off climate change. Uh, I heard the same arguments made about Bloomington Transit that the usage was down during this period of time. Um, and I think we really ought to thank Alex Crowley and his department. I mean, I've read the things they've done. I've read the reports they've initiated 
I think if we turn the city budget over his department, we'd be a lot farther ahead in climate change than we are currently. And I just, I think leadership requires us to get through the current pandemic, but we will get through it eventually. And on the other side of this, climate change is gonna be staring us in the face and we're frankly losing time. And it's a mistake, I think, to not address both. Um, and I would hope that that uh, climate change still is considered the number one objective uh, within our government. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Paul. I see Chair Scambaluri has returned. Um, yes. uh, thank you. Um, I will ask the clerk for the next public comment and uh, the next voice you hear after that will be our chair. So <laughs> Council <laughs> Chair Clerk Bolden, do we have anyone else? Uh, yes, next up Thank we you. have a comment from Sam Dove, which will be read by the council attorney. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sam Dove's comment, uh, I think is actually a question. Sam wants to know when the coronavirus will be done, uh, which is a comment or a sentiment I'm sure we all share. So thank you, Sam. Okay. Thank you. Um, and next up we have Lisa Podolka. If you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I just have a quick question about something that um, Caroline Shaw said. Um, I, I just really appreciated how comprehensive her bullet points were. And so this one definitely went by a little quickly. So um, I apologize if I misunderstood what she was saying, but it just um, popped out at me. So I just wanted to clarify about it. And I understand if she can't, um, if you can't, Caroline Shaw, uh, respond directly to this, but because I think it might be relatively straightforward, I'd love if you could. Um, I, th I thought I heard you mention that the title of crime an analyst will now be called the data analyst. And I was just wondering, first of all, why this change? And second of all, if that reflects any change in duties or whether it's just a simple issue of nomenclature. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shaw, did you want to respond to that now, or do we want to continue as public comment and then come back to you with that? I um, am I allowed to respond to that? I I I just I didn't think I was uh, permitted to yep. respond to that. <laughs> you may be right. Tell you what, hold up, and okay. I think we have a couple more comments. So let's go. Okay. Let's finish those up. So, Clerk Bolden. Okay. Next, we have Danielle Bird. If you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Hello. This is Danielle Bird. I'm a social worker in Bloomington. I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire profession or any employer, but I want to say that there are over, over 150 people signed a petition that stated they do not want to see the power and scope of policing increased in the way that's currently proposed by adding more social workers, adding more neighborhood resource specialists, uh, the data analyst, and many of those people who worked on that survey or the petition uh, and signed it, including myself, are social workers, service providers, and people with lived experience. Chief Decoff and the mayor don't acknowledge that other community agencies provide types of services that the police social worker and the neighborhood resource specialist provide, but they do. Uh, there's Shalom doing outreach. Middleway does crisis work uh, for domestic violence and rape. Youth Service Bureau works with families and children. Uh, the HAND staff used to provide uh, neighborhood services. I'm not sure what they're doing now. Area 10 Agency on Aging works with aging and elderly. New Leaf, New Life works with folks who have been incarcerated and are, who are trying to stay out of jail. Um, with the increased funds for these positions, they could increase capacity and provide more services in the interim so that we can take that time to study what, you know, we deserve more measured, equitable, anti-racist approach to these community safety issues. Um, and expanding the scope of the police is, is just not the way forward. And uh, also, as Council Member Flaherty stated, this creates a path dependency issue. Uh, I heard your HR um, person, um, I believe that was Ms. Shaw and Chief Decoff are talking about how this, uh, the approach that we're using here in Bloomington is being used as a model for other communities. 
there are other social workers across the nation right now who are organizing against this structure. We recognize social workers are wonderful to respond to crises and you know there are crisis intervention uh, services uh, and programs out there that, that do this in a different way. And they do it in a different way because that's what the community and vulnerable community members wanted. We have CAHOOTS doing it over 30 years out in Eugene, Oregon, Denver Star Program. So uh, they're doing it. They've started a pilot. It's been very successful. It saves the community money. Um, so there are other ways to do this. We don't need to jump on this right now and set this precedent so that we can be held up across the nation as this is how we should do social work and provide social services and safety to our community. So um, I just urge you to hit pause uh, on this, on these increases right now. And we can still, we can, we can add more capacity to these agencies that do these crisis interventions. We don't have to go down this road. Please uh, take some more time, study this some more, listen, center, center the needs of the vulnerable community members um, and listen to their voices. And I think Bloomington deserves better. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bird. And Madam Clerk, who is up next? Next up, we have Alex Goodlad. Mr. Goodlad, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. I will with pleasure. So um, I would, I guess, first like to um, uh, add my voice in, in agreement with uh, the last two comments and, and, and urge uh, the council to hit pause on, um, on, on the initiative to, you know, make the police do everything everything. They don't need to do everything and they shouldn't for many reasons that were eloquently stated by uh, everyone else. Um, and, uh, and, and let's, uh, let's get rid of the gas mask while we're at it, but you know, different, different item. Um, while we're at this item, I would, I would also like to um, uh, go into an exchange. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, all right. Yeah, I, I would like to go into a different exchange about uh, changing the name of uh, the um, of, of a department. Um, and I, I guess the exchange between Volan and Alex Crowley, with uh, Volan asking Alex and John and the mayor to name an example, and it doesn't seem like a, an example was was named. And uh, um, I think that speaks to kind of what the optics has been of these meetings, which suggests that um, currently we don't have the political will behind mass transit and alternative modes of transportation. And I, I think we got to step our uh, game up in that. Um, and, and then finally, um, I, I want to mention something involving the, uh, the, the, the data analyst or whoever does data, the, the name being changed. I, I hope that um, data is being collected on, um, you know, the, um, the discrepancies in arrest rates and use of force rates with uh, the police. Cause, cause right now as it stands, you know, me as a blogger does, does a better job collecting that data than, than what's going on. And I know that there's a lot of short staffness and whatnot, but, um, let's, let's, let's try to do better on that. However we can, um, all, and not just the police, but everyone as a community trying to gather data on um, on this issue that's very, very important to our community. Uh, I yield. Thanks. Okay. And last up, we have Aaron Predmore. Aaron, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can speak. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. It's Erin Fredmore with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I just wanted to bring uh, kind of a timeline to everyone's attention just for public discussion as we uh, consider the budget tonight. Um, just to remind everyone and all of our um, attendees and listeners tonight, we had our original presentation uh, from the administration in August. Uh, the first time to comment it was at that time after receiving the budget the preceding Friday. So it was on that Wednesday. Uh, which I know was, it was a great deal of information and, and many people, including many council members, uh, were still digesting the material at that time. Um, the next time that we had an opportunity to weigh in is uh, tonight. However, the chamber discovered last week that the budget has, was uh, formally noticed 
which eliminates all ability, was formally noticed by the administration to the state uh, and the public, which eliminates all ability to increase any line item at this point. Um, right now, the council can only decrease or cut um, and no other changes can be made. The chamber's uh, disappointed by the lack of transparency and collaboration uh, once again. This timetable was not clear to us uh, as we understand it, nor was it clear to many council members or the public, um, and it was not particularly well publicized. In the coming years, we know that the budget process will be harder because of reduced revenues. And the process, in, instead of what we've experienced this year, it must be more open, clear, and community facing. Perhaps we would wanna, uh, the council would wanna consider an ordinance that sets out a timeline with set days and times and, and dates just for publication for the entire public. Um, I know this year was unique in that there were many people that cared a great deal, as we're hearing again tonight, about different line items and issues that are going into the budget. And I know I've heard from many of you directly that you've received many emails and calls around about concerns around uh, BPD funding, around transportation, I mean, just all the same things that we're hearing tonight. If the public itself cannot have a set and public way to con um, convey their thoughts to both you, the council members, and the administration, um, then it makes this entire process a farce, which is, I know, not what we want to have in our community of Bloomington. And uh, so I encourage you all to look closely at that and to use um, your own opportunities to uh, publicize this and invite engagement from the public overall. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cardmore. Madam Clerk, who is our next speaker? Next up, we have Katie Yoder. Ms. Yoder, if you'd like to go ahead, you can unmute yourself. Um, I am in Council Member Smith's um, district in Park Ridge East, and we've recently had some conversations in our neighborhood association about speeding in the neighborhood, and um, I've had communication. I'm on the, our executive um, committee, and I've had communication with the Planning and Transportation Department about um, some things that are forthcoming on the table regarding um, traffic calming and that kind of thing. And tonight I'm just trying to keep my ear to the ground kind of on what's going on with council so I can prepare to communicate with the council about this, you know, hopefully in favor of a less onerous policy in order to make some changes in the neighborhood. And I'm really nervous that this initiative is just going to disappear because I haven't seen it yet, but then to find out tonight that it might be absorbed into the gosh, economic department and just you know, that and the larger problem of climate change, it's just uh, pretty concerning. And I especially, um, you know, I want council members to take note that this could be an impact of something like that being changed. So that's all. I didn't intend to comment tonight, but I got a little concerned hearing that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yoder. Um, I do, Madam Clerk, do we have any additional comments? I do not see any additional requests for comment and I'm just checking the chat to make sure that that holds true. So I think that's everybody. Okay, let's give it a few more seconds. And last call. Seeing none, let's return to council. Um, Council questions, additional council questions related to ordinance 2023. Council member Piedmont Smith, is that a hand? I can't quite see. Yes, um, I was wondering if Ms. Shaw wanted to respond to the question about the crime analyst being changed to data analyst that one of the members of the public had. I'm happy to. Um... And I will repeat what I think Chief Dekoff said earlier, and he can chime in if I get it something wrong. It's just a title change, and uh, this it's a more appropriate title change because they do a lot of data analysis, not just focused on crime. Is that, I can't remember her full question. Was there more to that? I think that was it. <laughs> I think so. Additional questions from council. Council member Piedmont Smith. Well, I, I was wondering if, if you would let me um, just uh, clarify something from the last public commenter. Um, Please, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Yoder was concerned about the uh, 
neighborhood traffic calming program and um, when that might come up. Uh, so that, that is totally separate from the transportation demand management position that we've been discussing this evening as part of the budget. Um, and I believe that the neighborhood traffic calming program, the new more streamlined program will be uh, on our agenda for next Wednesday. So never fear, it is coming. <laughs> Thank you. Additional questions, Council Member Smith. Thank you, Councilperson Piedmont Smith. I'm so glad that uh, you clarified that. I was going to ask for somebody to clarify it. So thank you very much because um, we want some traffic calming uh, look, see, and uh, maybe some speed bumps in our neighborhood. Thank you. Any additional questions before we go to final comment? And let's go to final comment then on ordinance 2023. Council member Bullen. I had uh, hoped to hear a persuasive argument tonight as to why the new TDM position should be housed in ESD. Um, the number one question that uh, I, I asked and was addressed in the general questions and comments on the 2021 budget hearings was my question about transportation policy. I pointed out that we're creating an engineering department, consolidating parking services into a division of public works and hiring a TDA manager, but placing it in ESD, I said I saw a new and problematic fragmentation of authority over transportation policy, that the people who should have the last word on determining it besides the mayor should be planners, not economic development officials, not public works officials, not engineers. And I was looking for a written statement of administrative, if not mayoral policy regarding how transportation decisions will be made. What I've heard tonight, the news is, the mayor is intending to remove the word transportation from the title of any department. The mayor is planning to, it, the, there is, there's been no written statement of this, uh, but it certainly tells me, it re re uh, uh, reasserts sort of the, the trending emphasis that this administration has had on uh, not wanting to talk about transportation policy uh, explicitly. Uh, I am thinking back to the 4th Street Garage, how for about $300,000 of extra expense in order to keep it repaired, the council last year by a 5-4 vote agreed to reopen the question and to build a new garage. Well, the cost overruns on that garage in terms of amount of extra time it took to get started, uh, the amount of, uh, of money spent on it, if it hasn't exceeded it, it will. If it hasn't exceeded the the cost of repairing the old garage while we uh, did TDM planning. Uh, I am thinking now about the links to which the administration tried to invoke eminent domain to remove uh, a, a landholder in order to make a bigger parking garage. This does not say TDM to me. This says, how much car parking can we get? Now, uh, we can disagree about the degree to which we should emphasize uh, the car, but I, I don't think I've been uh, uh, shy about my concern that we should be emphasizing transportation demand, not supply. And so far, despite the words said by various administration officials, the only thing I've seen in actions are an erosion of uh, a centralized transportation authority. Now, the administration wanted to say, well, we think transportation is so important that we're spreading it among the entire city. Uh, you know, I might have bought that argument a while ago, but right now what I see is uh, an unwillingness to commit to the kind of questions asked by council members Flaherty and Rosenbarger over College Muller Road. It, it's not even like, uh, you know, they, they wanted to see something done there to, uh, to pay more than lip service to bike and pet infrastructure. Okay, but the impulse 
of this administration across the board seems to be, well, it's not that important. They're not saying it's not important, but it's not important enough. It seems like I have to vote no on the budget in order to say how important it was. I remembered at the budget advance on April 29th, six out of nine council members argued for an increase in transportation infrastructure of some kind. And by that, I specifically meant bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. And I was struck at how many people said as much. That seems to be the priority of this council. It does not seem to be sufficiently the priority of the administration. And I'm very disappointed. I can't tell you how disappointed I am in it, except to say that I'm voting no right now on this, uh, on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Additional council comment. Council member Piedmont Smith and council member Flaherty. Yeah, um, I think uh, when I look at the memo that we received from controller Underwood yesterday, um, telling us about the changes that have occurred in the budget proposal since August, there are no changes that reflect concerns of council members. The only change is because of uh, Duke Energy increasing uh, rates and, and a few adjustments uh, of, of um, payroll because of, because of uh, you know, longevity, I mean, uh, turnover and stuff like that. There, there, there's no change that was requested by any colleagues, as far as I know, certainly not those that uh, were requested by me. Um, I wrote the mayor on September 22nd after we received the petition from uh, Danielle Bird um, about the uh, social workers being uh, placed within the police department um, and the ethical concerns of uh, somebody who is a licensed social worker reporting to law enforcement. And those raised real concerns for me. Um, but I did not receive any response from the mayor to my, to my email message. Um, I also expressed concern to him about the transportation demand management position and that it really should uh, be in planning and transportation um, like our uh, TDM consultants who worked on our plan uh, recommended. Um, I, uh, I do not see the administration as being collaborative or forthcoming uh, in this budget process. And I haven't seen it in any of my many years on the city council and I'm tired of it. Um, what Ms. Predmore of the chamber said um, uh, regarding the process and the, the need to advertise uh, the budget and such um, it is largely true. I think that we have a, a, a slightly bit more uh, wiggle room um, because of the schedule that we've set out for ourselves. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that the forms are all filled out and um, we have very little opportunity. Well, we have no opportunity really uh, to um, make any changes to the budget other than that cuts. Um, so I think uh, a colleague of mine has said, you know, we have uh, a hammer to do the job of a scalpel. Um, all we can do is just say no. And uh, that's kind of the nuclear option that nobody wants to take. Um, but uh, this administration has, has just uh, not shown that they really want to listen to what we have to say. I think what my colleague, Council Member Volan said about you know, the budget advance um, is true that we expressed many concerns that were then not really reflected in the budget. Uh, several of us wanted a parking cash out program and have wanted it for years and that's still not part of the budget. Um, so I, I, you know, I think there are good things in this, this ordinance. Um, there, um, 
are some necessary new positions, some changes that you know were reviewed by human resources professionals, and and I have no issue with those. But I do I do have an issue with uh, the TDM position um, not being in the planning and transportation department, and I do have an issue with uh, continuing this trend of social workers reporting to law enforcement. Um, so at this point, I'm going to be voting no on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Yes, thanks. I'll be voting no on the due pass vote for this ordinance tonight. Um, the issues for me are largely structural. Uh, you know, as far as I can tell, and I asked this question, the, the budget as presented today is a representation solely of the mayor's vision and priorities. Um, zero changes were made between the budget hearings and now in response to council member concerns and requests. Um, and nor do I, uh, in addition to my colleagues, feel like our requests and our um, preferences and, and policy priorities as uh, laid out in the budget advance meeting were taken seriously. I talked to um, most council members and uh, I don't believe there was any follow up from that meeting. There was no discussion of what it would mean to, to implement some of the things we talked about. And I don't feel like this budget reflects those, um, a lot of those priorities that were stated by council members. Um, Mayor Hamilton has said that the city budget is the biggest and most important policy document the city has. And I agree. Um, and a final yes or no vote is simply not an adequate level of input for the city's elected fiscal body. Um, all of us on the council have policy priorities and views that deserve meaningful collaboration um, and some measure of compromise from the mayoral administration in reaching a consensus budget, even if it's not the preferred outcome of the mayor. Um, and we simply haven't seen that. And that's true of other appropriation ordinances as well. Uh, so there are broader takeaways here, substan substantial you know, and fundamental changes that I think we need to make uh, regarding our budgeting process going forward. Some of those are timing and simply allowing more time and clarifying timelines for the council and for public ab about how to do things. But um, as Ms. Predmore spoke to, um, there, there's really a need for, for some built-in codified opportunity uh, for uh, meaningful public engagement, council member and, and executive back and forth that would allow for some level of compromise and, and actual um, you know, discussion of trade-offs as opposed to this, um, we heard your concerns, did nothing, and here's the budget, vote yes or no, that's just not adequate. Um, Let's see, um, you know, on policing and public safety, there's, this is a very, very big and complicated issue, obviously, there, and there's a lot of um, things we could discuss. Uh, I will say I'm, I've been generally disappointed with the answers to the questions uh, that I've posed, um, both in meetings and in written questions. I feel like a, a lot of the questions I've asked simply don't get answered, or they're sort of answered with a, uh, they're an answer to a different question, or they're only partially answered. Um, in particular, I've asked repeatedly about what the police department is doing to engage with the movement for black lives, um, which is a coalition of, of over 50 groups representing not just the Black Lives Matter network, but uh, many others and endorsed by groups like um, Color of Change and, and others. It's, it's, um, if you're not familiar, uh, folks should check out you know, their advocacy and website. And I feel like they are thought leaders in progressive public safety advocacy in this country. And I keep being told that we're a progressive police department, one of the most progressive in the country. And if that is true, we can't be ignoring the policy conversation that is happening around uh, reinvestment in community, addressing root causes of crime, and, and real transformative and structural changes to public safety uh, that address the longstanding uh, socioeconomic and racial disparities in, in policing outcomes that we see locally here in Bloomington, as our data show, uh, just like we see everywhere nationally. And I really just don't think there's been much meaningful engagement with that conversation at all yet. And that's very disappointing. Um, I expressed my disappointment about the, the placement of the social worker positions and resource specialists as well. And I think, I thank Ms. Bird for commenting tonight. And I, and I broadly agree with, with um, the position uh, you know, that she and, and others have advocated. Finally, um, regarding TDM, um, you know, similarly, I, the mayor and city staff a number of times tonight have referenced the Novak Consulting Report uh, and, and justified you know, moving engineering because of the result of the recommendations of that report. But, but when we have a TDM report that recommends placing a TDM program in the transportation department, just like most cities do, uh, we ignore that. Um, and that doesn't make sense to me. Um, it's, it's transportation policy. Uh, that is what it is. 
Um, and, and frankly, you know, I share some of the concerns that based on recent past experience with regard, with regard to transportation supply and demand issues, um, that there are some, some meaningful gaps in, in, in sound policy understanding uh, with regards to transportation uh, in, the, in the ESD department. And that's, that's not, I don't intend any disrespect there. ESD is very good at, at many things. Um, I just don't view transfer, transportation policy as, as one of them necessarily. Um, so sorry, I, I just, I know that's a lot. I kind of wanted to speak to the main sticking points for me. Um, again, it comes back to structural issues um, and, and a couple of policy issues that are particular sticking points. Um, I think these, these are questions that the council should have a meaningful role in addressing and, and some level of collaboration and compromise with the administration is needed and we just haven't seen that. So again, I'll be voting no tonight, thanks. Thank you. Additional final comment from any council members? Last call. And okay. may I, council member Rosenberg. I'll go ahead and give one, although I think I'm gonna sound a little repetitive uh, based on what's been said so far. You know, as a new council member, this is my first budget experience, and I would say it is not exactly uh, how I thought it would happen. I know we had the budget advance in May, and I, I think that was a time for council members, right, to talk about what we'd like to see, and I think that was potentially our first opportunity to do that. And I don't see much of that reflected in this year's budget. Of course, it's a difficult time. We're in a pandemic. But I think, you know, the budget that was presented to us, it feels like we just, in a way, wasted all of those hours. And then, I mean, I would say out of the nine of us, we've collectively spent hundreds of hours on this. And it almost feels like, for what? I'm hoping that after this, this process, this year, we can get to a place where we debrief, where we talk about what makes sense, um, times that so maybe we need to. Come here, sorry. Um, maybe there are times we need to put in put in writing or have you know have more of a back and forth. I just I feel like we've been more on the, the administration. Maybe has been more on the defensive in, in defending the budget instead of working with us to talk about some changes that might be possible. You know, I, TDM is one example of that. I, to me, it's not a big move, especially, especially with the mayor saying it could fit in both spaces. So if, you know, it's a difference of a, an opinion, why not sometimes give and take a little, a little to, you know, in the, just in the spirit of we're all elected officials here and we're trying to do our best. And maybe sometimes we don't, see exactly the same way, but it can, it can still be good, right? So um, TDM in general is concerning for me. I mean, I, I think most of this is more of like a systemic problem. And I know there's been a lot of talk of collaborating together, but so far in these 10 months, nine months, I haven't, I haven't seen that. And I, I think maybe the only way to get something to change is to make big moves, right? So for this ordinance tonight, my plan is to vote no. I'm hoping between now and when we actually vote on the budget, some changes could be made because I think we all wanna pass a budget for the city. Thanks. Thank you. And that was last call. Are there any remaining comments? Okay. Mayor Hamilton, did you want to offer a comment? Well, I I do appreciate it. I know it's it's not typical, but I feel like there have been quite a few references to um, actions or or inactions, and I do I do appreciate the chance just to 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 address you very briefly. Um, I, I, and I look forward to working with you all on this. Um, Look, this is a state process that is no different this year than it's been for many, many years in terms of timing, having to give notice, all those things. Uh, and we certainly um, uh, have actually been more transparent than ever with that, giving some of the new stuff we're doing online. But I just I do want to respond 
I actually think this administration has tried to listen carefully to goals. And one example is the pay scale for temporary workers. That was absolutely a huge change in the budget uh, in a couple of years ago that was in response to uh, feedback on the budget and, and the idea that we didn't respond to that. In Recover Forward, as you all know this year, just to be direct about this, I think you'll all affirm that in J July, when I put the proposal for Recover Forward, I shared with each of you a very detailed spreadsheet about what could be invested in 2020 and 2021 in Recover Forward with all those line items and saying, what do you think we should do? What is your input on what we should spend, what we should invest in Recover Forward? I asked each of you for input on all of those items and some of you gave it and, and it affected it. It, it, it definitely affected that. Um, uh, so it, it is a little frustrating to hear a reference to that. Um, the, the, um, in terms of the budget advance, which is an early thing in April, we heard the investment in sidewalks and transportation as important. Look at the recover forward investment that you have supported in 2020 and that we have in the budget in 2021. It has hundreds of thousands of new dollars to invest in sidewalks and to support BT and other things because of that discussion. So I just, I just wanted to, to share that. Uh, it's, it's a little um, frustrating to hear that. And as, as you well know too, uh, we did meet directly and many and several times about the police to talk about different ideas. So you have different ideas. Nine of you have different ideas of what should be done. And I'm trying to hear those ideas and respect them and, and came back with different changes tonight. You also know we meet regularly with your leadership every week. We've offered to meet every other week on pure substantive discussions about issues uh, like that uh, and welcome all of those meetings. So uh, I, I certainly welcome uh, more input. I just want to make clear that we do adjust the budget based upon that input. We have adjusted the budget. We continue to adjust the budget. We welcome input on this budget. As I said, the three things I heard were move TDM, don't do engineering, and change police. And we've talked about all of those, and I know we don't all agree on all that, but your feedback's been really helpful and important in that. So I'll, I'll let you go back to regular order. Thank you. Thank you. And that was unusual and a bit out of order, but certainly I recognize you, Mayor. So with that, are there any final comments from council? And seeing none, I'll need a move to pass. Move to pass. Move to pass. Second. Second. Council members. I'll let people sort that out later. Um, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Councilmember Rosenbarger? No. Sims? Yes. Volan? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Flaherty? No. Smith? No. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Rollo? Yes. Scambolori? No. And I have that as 360. And with that, we move on to the third of three salary ordinances. This is Ordinance 2024 to fix the salaries of all elected city officials for the city of Bloomington year 2021. Ms. Shaw. Good evening again, council members. This next ordinance is uh, the ordinance for elected officials for the city of Bloomington ordinance number 2024. It sets the maximum 2021 salary rates for city of Bloomington elected officials, which include the mayor, city council members and the city clerk. These maximum salaries represent a 2% increase and are consistent with the current ordinance um, 2024, which also assigns an additional $1,000 per year to city council president and $800 per year for the city council vice president due to the additional responsibilities of those positions. I'm happy to take any questions regarding this ordinance at, that, at this time. Questions from council? Seeing none, shall we go to public comment? Okay. Clerk Bolden. I do not see 
any hands raised for this ordinance or any public comment? Okay, let's just give it another few seconds. Last call. And let's come back to council for any additional questions or final comments. Seeing none, is there a move you pass? So moved. Second. And Cliff Bolden, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Council Member Volan. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Smith. You're muted. Sorry. Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Sims? Yes. Okay. And that's 900. Thank you. That finishes up the three salary ordinances for 2021, and now we'll be moving into appropriation ordinances. So again, we are doing these a little bit out of order numerically, um, but let's go first to appropriation ordinance 2005. This is an ordinance adopting a budget for the operation, maintenance, debt service, and capital improvements for the water and wastewater utility departments of the city of Bloomington. And I believe we have Mr. Kelson with us. Can everyone see me and hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Vic Kelson, Utilities Director for the City. Um, I would appreciate if you would indulge me for just a moment uh, before I start, because I want to share a story with you. Yesterday, uh, there was an accident. A uh, delivery vehicle hit one of our trucks. Uh, and when our truck was hit, it spun around and uh, it hit uh, a pedestrian. Uh, we don't know what condition the pedestrian is in, but I do want to, on the behalf of the department, to express our, our, our concern and best wishes for a speedy recovery uh, to the pedestrian who was hit. So I just uh, want to make mention of that. Um, we're here uh, tonight to discuss uh, the uh, water and wastewater budget uh, for water. We are bringing uh, essentially, this, uh, for both total budgets, it's the same as it was uh, during the budget hearing. Uh, the changes that have been made were uh, corrections to the salary lines that were made uh, one by one, uh, line by line in cooperation with the controller's office. There were just some things that had been misentered, so they were corrected. Uh, because of the way we budget, uh, we budget every dollar of, of anticipated revenue. And the, uh, uh, the, the way it all works is we budget the, the personnel services, the supplies, the other services, the debt service sinking fund, uh, and then whatever else is left of anticipated revenues goes into a category called extensions and replacements. So for each utility, when corrections were made uh, and numbers were added, to the personnel services, those dollars were removed from extensions and replacements. So uh, where we are uh, is uh, in water, personnel services of $4.75 million, uh, for supplies, $1.74 million, other services, $3.84 million, uh, the sinking fund is $5.3 million, and then extensions and replacements are about $2.1 million for a grand total of 17 million seven hundred three thousand dollars is seven hundred sorry seventeen million seven hundred three thousand seven hundred sixty eight dollars uh, on the sewer and stormwater side both budgets are uh, both the budgets for the sewer works and the stormwater utility are combined into one budget uh, for personnel services 
It's around $9.1 million for supplies, around $1.25 million. For other services, about $5.1 million. Uh, the debt service sinking fund is around $5.04 million, and that's about $4.5 million for sewer and uh, almost a million dollars for storm. Uh, and then for extensions and replacements, uh, it's a total of $5.37 million uh, for, for sewer and, and storm combined. Uh, about 900,000 of that is uh, for the stormwater utility. The grand total uh, budget for the sewer works and stormwater utility is $25,843,049. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have, uh, but the only change that we've had since the hearings was the correction of the salary numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelson. Let's go to council questions. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, um, Mr. Kelson, could you please explain in the uh, section one for the water utility, where does the revenue called fire protection come from? Uh, everyone's bill has a line on it for fire protection. Uh, it basically pays for the uh, maintenance of all the fire lines uh, that we, of all the fire, uh, uh, fire infrastructure we provide, which is hydrants and so forth but it's a, it's a line on your bill. Okay, you can tell in my household, I'm not the one who pays that bill. <laughs> um, and then the other question was uh, the other income. Where does that come from? Um, uh, in the water utility? Yeah. Oh, that's a question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that uh, in uh, right off the top of my head. I can ask our finance director that and, and, and get back to you. Okay, Thank you. thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith, was that all your questions? Yes, thank you. Okay. Additional questions. Seeing none, let's go to public comment. Madam Clerk. Sorry. Um, no, I do not see any comment from the public in either hands raised or chat. Let's just wait a few more seconds then. Um, I do have a question for the council attorney. Should we mention that this is okay. the public comment part portion of this deliberation is the statutorily required public hearing? I believe that announcement applies to App Ward 2004 and 2006. Mm -hmm. This is 2005. I thought we were on 2004, I apologize. Okay. And are any additional members of the public wishing to comment? Clerk Bolden. Okay, thank you. Let's come back to council for final questions. Or final comments. Move and to have a, thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank, thank you all. Madam Clerk, will you please call the vote? Absolutely. Council Member hmm, Piedmont Smith? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Volin? Yes. And that's 900. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Kelson. With that, let's go to the second of three appropriation ordinances. This is Appropriation Ordinance 2006, Appropriations and Tax Rates for Bloomington Transportation Corporation for 2021. And I believe we have Mr. May with us. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm Lou May. I'm general manager for Bloomington Public Transportation Corporation. Since I was here last in August at our budget presentation then, there have been no changes to our budget uh, proposed for 2021. We are proposing a budget in 2021 of $14,505,793. And that is a 3.8% increase over the 2020 budget. Thank you for your past support of public transportation, specifically Bloomington Transit in the community. And I'm glad to entertain any questions or comments that you may have about the proposed 2021 budget. Thank you, Mr. May. Let's come to council for questions. Seeing none, let's move to public comment. Madam Clerk, are you seeing any requests for public comment? None at all. Mr. Lucas? Now I'll jump in and say that the uh, public comment portion of uh, on this item constitutes the uh, legally required public hearing on this budget. Thank you. No? Last call then for public comment. <clears throat> and let's come back to council. Any additional questions? Council member Boland, sorry, I didn't see you right away. Yes, uh, Mr. May, I'd like to pick up on a, a theme that council member Smith uh, discussed earlier this evening. He said that uh, because uh, of the pandemic, there is a reduced emphasis on transportation. I wonder if you might comment uh, on uh, how you and BT are thinking about transportation during the pandemic, about the funding of transportation and about the future of public transit uh, with respect to the pandemic. Great question, thank you. Um... As the cliche that you've heard so often, there is no playbook, there's no game plan to navigate through a pandemic. Uh, this is the first time that, that we've done it as, as well as all transit systems across the country and across the world for that matter. So um, we're in uncharted waters, so to speak. And um, we're greatly concerned about the impact that the pandemic has had on our ridership. Uh, we're currently running about 23% of normal uh, compared to the same time a year ago. And uh, so we've lost more than three quarters of our total ridership. And uh, I've often said that um, social distancing and mass transit uh, aren't very compatible uh, concepts there. They don't work as very well together. They don't mesh. Um, so we're concerned about it going forward. Uh, we have seen impacts on our funding uh, for public transit. For example, in the 2021 budget, uh, the state of Indiana has done an across the board 13% reduction in state funding for transit. And presumably that's due to a reduction in general revenues that, that the state is realizing as a result of the pandemic there. Uh, no doubt we're going to see impacts to local funding as we move forward. Um, we, we don't anticipate any major impacts in the 2021 budget for things like local income tax, um, but chances are by the time we get to 2022 and, and beyond, uh, there probably are gonna be some significant reductions in, in local income tax and possibly other local taxes that help to support public transportation. Um, we are fortunate in that uh, the federal government has provided us with a, a large infusion of CARES Act funding. We have a total of about $7.8 million, and that is going to help us in the short term, uh, meaning probably the next two to two and a half years or so. There is a possibility that the federal government may provide some additional uh, assistance for public transit systems uh, that are, are really hemorrhaging ridership and, and 
seeing significant reductions in their funding across the country there. So uh, it's, it's hard to predict uh, when this is going to end and when things are going to return to normal. Um, I think it's gonna be a, a long time. It's gonna be several years, uh, maybe more than five years before we, we see it. It, it. Some of it I think depends on the availability of a vaccine, um, herd immunity and, and other factors. We, and, and it's difficult to, to answer some of those questions. Um, so I'm, I'm greatly concerned, I guess, to answer your question. I, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have real good answers uh, except to uh, communicate the concerns that I have. Uh, maybe the one follow-up I would ask is, do you think now is the time to invest less in public transit if you're any kind of a policymaker, decision maker? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, We've talked, I know you as a council, I've talked a lot tonight about climate change and the importance of, of that issue uh, on a national and global uh, scale. And that, that issue isn't going away. And uh, public transportation, I think, makes a, uh, or, or offers a great strategy to address that issue. And uh, I, I would encourage policymakers at the local, state, and federal level not to disinvest in transit at this time because of the, uh, the way that we can help uh, affect this, this topic that is so dear to our country and to the world. Thank you, Mr. May. I appreciate it. Thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Flaherty or Oh, okay. Seeing none then, let's go to any final comments. Seeing none, may I have a motion for due pass? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll for us? Yes, Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Morello? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Piedmont Smith? Yes. That's nine zero zero. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr. May. And with that, we come to the third of three appropriation ordinances. This is Appropriation Ordinance 2004, an ordinance for appropriation and tax rates, establishing 21, the, excuse me, the 2021 Civil City Budget for the City of Bloomington. And I believe we have Mr. Underwood with us. Good evening. Uh, feel, I, I, I don't usually get to go last, so it's a little different for me. So hang on just a minute here. I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully. All right, can you see that? Yes, thank you. All right, let's start from the beginning. Uh, good evening. Um, what I'll do tonight is uh, this is an updated memo uh, from what I presented uh, back in August and talk about some of the differences both in uh, presentation and changes that have been made. Um, as you know, we do four nights of hearings uh, in August uh, that are in a program budget uh, format. That is uh, different than uh, what you see um, as being presented to you uh, as an app, uh, as a, um, app board uh, that's mandated by the state. So everything that we kind of did uh, from prior to this is processes that we've developed collaboratively between the council and the mayor's office and, and my budget and my office as well to uh, present the budget in a uh, format that's probably more user friendly. It's more granular uh, and uh, it, it really dives down into the programs of those. And we've worked with the council 
uh, over the last four years to uh, kind of uh, define that and make changes. And, and, and finally this year, uh, I think we, we got to a good point where uh, we show the programs, we show the population served, we show the amount of employees and FTEs that are presented in those programs. Uh, and we had 20 hours of uh, hearings that also included uh, opportunities for public comment. In that time, you all sub uh, submitted to us uh, numerous questions of which we were happy to answer back. And then as I spoke back in August, we moved into the more formal process that's completely mandated by the state. Uh, the state requires the types of forms that you have seen. Uh, you, you only vote on an app board that is the different funds uh, that we have presented budgets out of. Uh, the opportunity for you there is a uh, vote up or down. You can decrease as well any of those individual um, funds themselves. We're required to post uh, 10 days in advance of the public hearing, uh, which is tonight on the uh, Department of, of uh, uh, Government Finance uh, a advertisement that advertises uh, both the fund balances and the um, uh, the levies that go with that. So uh, unfortunately, as we get into this part of it, it's very mandated by the state. We can't, uh, we, we can't alter from that process. Uh, and then we also have to advertise uh, the night that the um, budget will be considered uh, for a vote. And again, that's an up or down, or uh, you, as I said, you can cut. So uh, wanted to bring that out that uh, we do this differently than most uh, municipalities. I've talked to many of them and, and they're surprised that we do four nights of hearings, that we do budget presentations that are completely different from the state forms. Typically, a lot of places do the two nights. They do the public hearing and then they do uh, the passage. And if they do other nights, they use the state forms only to do that. So we essentially do a budget twice. We do it in the program budget format and then we translate that into uh, the state's required um, process. So a lot of work goes into it. Thank you for all your input as well. I'd like to thank my staff and department heads that have worked uh, many long hours uh, on this budget. And uh, so I'll dive back in. You know, we, we're in unusual times. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we've seen significant reduction in revenues already in uh, streets and parks and, and the food and beverage. Uh, we obviously believe that's gonna continue on to other revenues, especially in 22 and 23, as we've said those tend to lag behind uh, any significant reduction in those revenues. Uh, cash reserve, again, we, we continue to remain strong. In 2019, we ended with, uh, uh, between the general fund balance and the rainy day fund balance, 50.9%, uh, which is basically would cover 50% of the city's general fund expenditures. We're projecting those levels to be 36 and 29.4 at the ends of 20 and 21. Uh, property taxes continue to be the biggest uh, fund element for uh, the general fund, uh, represents 51.3% of the total revenues in the general fund, and uh, we expect those to increase by 4.2%. Miscellaneous revenues, uh, such as fees for services, fines, interest income, uh, reimbursements from the federal government, represent 23% of the total city budget. Uh, and as we've noted, uh, we're proposing to use $2 million dollars from the rainy day fund this year in order to provide funding for recover forward initiatives. In addition, we'll be using approximately uh, $1.3 million in reserves uh, to continue funding and maintaining ongoing services. Uh, local income taxes, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Obviously this year was much different uh, with the pandemic and the governor moving out uh, the tax filing deadlines from April till June and then moving out uh, the uh, timelines for uh, the state budget agency and the Department of Local Government Finance to get us those estimates. Uh, they had suggested using 90%. We budgeted at 100% levels. Uh, I'm happy to say, but unfortunately, the timing was such that we had to push the button to advertise to hit that 10 day uh, notice that we got the uh, revised totals right about that time. So we expect about a $1.18 million uh, in additional um, TIF or um, LIT funds this year. And while it doesn't impact the overall budget request, it will provide a backstop to the city's uh, general fund reserves. Uh, expenditure side of things, the overall budget uh, is 95 million. 
uh, which is a decrease of 3.5 million or 3.6%. Uh, this decrease is primarily due to a decrease of $5 million in food and beverage funds. Uh, in the general fund, the overall budget request is uh, just over $48.5 million. This is an increase of about $1.8 million or 3.8%. When you factor in the $2 million for Recover Forward uh, and a $194,000 decrease in property taxes, basically the general fund request this year uh, was flat. Uh, Parks General Fund is actually a decrease at $8.5 million or 1.2%. And then public safety uh, is a component of the lit uh, that comes in separately. Uh, we expect to receive about $5.3 million there and another $928,000 in E911 revenues. Uh, $2.2 million of the lit and all of the E911 money uh, will go to fund this uh, central dispatch. And then the other $3 million goes to fund the police and fire operations and primarily uh, capital plus some operating costs this year. Um, summary of changes, the total budget uh, from what was presented in August is an actual decrease of about $17,000 and a decrease of $136,000 to the general fund. Uh, changes are primarily in category one and categories three, categories one personnel costs, and these are just adjustments and corrections uh, the various positions, the amounts calculated by the position budgeting software. So we make those changes as we go. Uh, the other thing that came through in between times was that uh, Duke Energy uh, got a, approved for a rate increase and we received the notice of that after the budget was presented in August. And then finally, the other uh, material change was a transfer in uh, of $35,000 in Recover Forward funds that moved from ESD to uh, information technology, and that was for the funding of the coding school. Uh, jumping down, uh, this is an exhibit just to show you by category, the changes, the top half of this is by fund. So you see the general fund, public safety lit, parks general fund, local roads and streets, MDH, motor vehicle highway, parking facilities, solid waste and fleet maintenance, and the changes, and again, uh, $108,000 decrease in category one total, uh, $91,000 increase in category three related to um, Duke Energy uh, and a total decrease of just over $17,000. And then bro I broke that down for in the general fund so you could actually see by department uh, where those changes were. And again, the majority of them were uh, in personnel were in three departments and then um, uh, energy cost uh, accounted for the other uh, $16,000. Taking a look at uh, of how things break down. so. When we talk about uh, breakdown of function, uh, this is uh, not, uh, this is how we operate so much. So as you can see uh, in the parks and general fund, public safety represents about 42% of the budget, parks and recreation about 15%. Uh, services, these are the uh, forward facing departments like uh, CFRD and HAND uh, represent 29%. Uh, capital is another 1%, and then administrative departments like the uh, controller's office, legal department, HR, represents about 12%. And we try to be around 10 to 12% of that. Um, then when you take a look at it by uh, category, this is the formal categories, categories one, two, three, and four, uh, you can see that uh, what a uh, picture this paints, that in the two general operating departments of the city, 73% of the budgeted costs are personnel, uh, so it's people. Uh, services are about 22%, supplies about 3%. So in services, you're, you're seeing your electric bills and those kinds of things, supplies, very small part of what we do. When you take a look at all of uh, the budgeted funds that we present, you can see public safety drops down to about 34%. Services jump up to 40%. Administration drops down to 9% and parks and recreation is 9%. And you also have dark uh, debt service, your capital expenditures and tax caps. When you look at that from uh, the categories one, two, three, and four, again, you can see of the total budgeted funds of that $95 million, $52 million that is for personnel costs. So again, we're in the people business. Uh, this is just the historic le levy growth that uh, we've looked at. And uh, you can see uh, in the 2000, Nine, when we started to get into economic downturn, that lag impact uh, that was uh, hit in 2011 and really didn't start to recover from until 2017. 
started an upward trend. And then I think we'll start to see that go back down, especially if the pandemic continues to move along. Um, this is just showing the, the reserves numbers that we talked about with the, the 36% and the 29.4. Uh, again, this is in the general fund. Uh, the breakdown of uh, budgets within the general fund by department. And again, we broke it out a little bit different for you this year to show you uh, the base budget request and then adding in the uh, recover forward. So you get some idea of what the base budget request was, which was $46.5 million. And last year's budget was 46.7. So uh, you add back in that reduction in the tax caps. That's where you get that 0%. Uh, and again, the parts department uh, down $105,000. Uh, this is just the historic uh, cash balances uh, that we show you that we've uh, that the council had asked that we present. We've done, this is year number two for you now, so you can see what those trends have been in the different funds, but really interesting to look at what the general fund was back in 2008, where it was a negative number uh, to where we've got the reserves at the end of 19 uh, up to 50.9%. Uh, and then finally, uh, the um, projections for the PS lit uh, capital funds for the fire department going out to uh, uh, 2030, as well as the fire department or police department. And then finally, um, how that got allocated for this year. And then um, the capital list that you all asked that we uh, begin uh, to include as well. This was an ad starting last year, the breakdown of the capital. Uh, so with that, uh, I will be happy to answer questions. Uh, my fellow department heads are here as well. Uh, and um, we'd be happy to entertain questions from the council and the public. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. And we may need you to share screen again at, at some point if people want to see a graph again, but thank you sure. for being ready to do that. Let's come to council for questions. Mr. Oh, Rollo. Mr. Rollo, I'm sorry. Missed it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Underwood, would you say, what would you say would be uh, the, the greatest potential um, so far unrealized uh, risk that we're facing financially? Uh, uh, would, it, would it be a real estate decline? With with the attendant decline in assessed values, I would say first that the, the extended pandemic, if 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 uh, you know businesses aren't allowed to operate at at full percent, um, the local income tax is one of the true local taxes that we get to control. Uh, that's uh, you know that that's the second largest revenue stream that we have. Uh, so I think that that's potentials out there followed by a lack of investment um, in, in growth in the community. Uh, Bloomington and Monroe County have been very lucky in that our assessed value and investment in, in brick and mortar has been very, very strong, uh, outperforming the rest of the state in many cases where they were going downhill. Uh, our property tax caps, while not insignificant, uh, haven't been nearly as bad as other um, communities. Uh, so that would be the second biggest thing is if uh, investment goes down, people start hitting the caps, uh, then your property tax revenues are going to go down. So those are the two biggest um, threats that I see that if this pandemic continues to go uh, long term. So if we have a significant second wave, uh, we've, we've kind of seen things tick back up, things opening back up. Uh, we've seen food and beverage start to tick back up, uh, which is always a good sign because that's kind of a lead, lead revenue. Um, so uh, if we if we get that second wave and, and things get shuttered again, then that's going to have a longer lasting impact. And as I recall, in 2008, I mean, there was considerable intervention by the federal government and also um, uh, the Federal Reserve, for instance. And, um, you know, uh, I think the Federal Reserve is essentially out of ammunition at this point, but the, we could have uh, federal, depending upon the administration, uh, in the coming term, we could have uh, funding packages that could assist us. But uh, that recovery was relatively quick, wasn't it, for us? When did we get back to full capacity as a city after 2008? 
What did it take? Uh, two years, three? People, well, you could see that uh, uh, probably 2015 before we started looking at uh, starting to increase back up staffing levels, uh, there were significant cuts and, and um, Deputy Mayor Renheisen, and he's, he's got, uh, I, that was kind of a period I was gone, but uh, from the chart, well, I know from, from a hiring perspective, 2015, we just began to rehire, uh, refill positions that have been that have been frozen out. And you, as you can see from the, the uh, um, levy growth, uh, it was 2017, so. Uh, so it was well more than, it was six, seven, eight years. Right, yeah, and again, you saw the biggest things that, that what came back uh, first was starting to hire people uh, and then uh, an investment in training. You know, we were able to get that up, uh, back up relatively quickly and the lag has been uh, the capital. We've been able to do a lot, obviously, with the, the PS lit and, and selling of bonds, been able to tackle uh, a huge amount of the backlog on capital investment. And that's really, that, that generates multiple dollars because it, it creates employment opportunities. It, it, it creates um, spending by those people. So, um, you know, construction projects are always nice because they, 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 the dollars are three or four times what you spend. Um, but what we've, you know, we've not fully recovered from that. We were getting close uh, that to plug that hole in the, the repair and maintenance that we should be doing on, on a regular basis. We, while we were able to get to some of that, we didn't get to 100% yet. So um, I'm hoping it'll be short-lived, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to be strategic on that. And, and uh, you know, departments, you know, we've, we've seen with the parks department and with the street department, uh, that's already, they're already being hit. I see. Uh, thanks for elaborating on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Additional question, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I was looking at the uh, budget form one uh, for the various departments, and there's always a line that says property tax caps, but it's always zero. So, could you explain where our property tax caps? Are if they're not in this form, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the the state I I plug it in. Um, you can see as a separate item on the the exhibit that I put together for the general fund. The state does their magic where uh, I think it's actually. And if you'll give me a minute, uh, they because they move it on us every year. Um, because I just recently found it. Give me a minute and I'll, I'll, I'll point it out to you, um, Counselor. Oh, okay, uh, on the notice to budget, it's on form three. Uh, you can see that uh, in the middle of that, they, they talk about the um, estimated civil city max levy right in the middle of the page of $33.2 million and the property tax credit estimate of $745,000. So it gets hidden uh, in this process. It, they, they have it in the forms, uh, form ones, and I plug it in for our purposes, but we do that all out of the general fund. They put a line in for every department almost in every fund, but we choose to um, take those impacts in the general fund and not hurt anybody else. So where is it? It's in uh, form three, no. so that the first one? Yeah, notice the taxpayers. I'm sure it's there. I still don't see it, but I'll find it. I had a couple it's, other it's questions. Right, it's, it's right in the middle before you get into the budgets. It's up in the wording section. Oh, in the, okay. Um, I wanted, oh, I see it, okay. So it doesn't need to be spelled out per department. No. Yeah, that didn't. Yeah, make we much some sense. some say some eight, some municipalities they they break it up between funds. They break it up between departments. I just show it as a lump sum okay. in the general fund. We don't we don't hit the parks department because they're funding so tight anyway, or any other fund with it. Okay, thank you, Miss mm -hmm. Gambaleri. I had another question. Go ahead. Please. Also kind of a technical. Um, so uh, you mentioned in your uh, memo from yesterday that uh, 
some of the changes um, in the changes in category three are related to a rate increase from Duke Energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and then you had a listing of the different funds that had changes in category three, and one of them was local roads and streets. And I was trying to figure out in my head how, how a Duke Energy rate increase would affect they pay, the road they pay and street the, funds. They, they pay the utility bills for their building. $49,000? They're, they're a significant user of, of, uh, of electricity, but we can get to, I can get you the breakdown of what those bills are. I mean, they're not in City Hall, so that's the no. biggest building we have. Right. It just seems I can disproportionate some, to me. Yeah, I, I can get you some additional information on that. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? While well, council members are, are thinking about that, um, for those of you in the public who may wish to offer public comment, you may wanna start um, using the raise hand function or entering a note in chat. Um, and again, to use the raise hand function, you'll wanna to go to participants and then scroll all the way down and you'll have that option to raise your hand. Did I say that, did I do that right? Yes. So back to council, are there any, any questions? Okay, with that, let's go to public comment on appropriation ordinance. I, I had another question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, I apologize. Um, so uh, Mr. Underwood, also in your, um, your memo, you said that in the all funds, the overall budget was 95 million which yes. is a decrease of about 3.5 million, but that's primarily due to a decrease of 5 million in the food and beverage tax. Yes. So does that mean that overall the budget actually increased if we take out the food and beverage tax? Uh, slightly because uh, it, it went up, it went down three point, uh, let me get to my notes here. It went down three and a half million dollars and five, yeah, so it went up about a million and a half total. So does that include the 1.3 million that we are investing in Recover Forward? Uh, yes. Okay, so it's that 1.3 million and then a little more. Uh, yeah, actually that what, is the, increase. We're, we're, the budget, the way it was presented was $2 million for Recover Forward and then we needed another $1.3 million for um, to um, that that was deficit spending. So yeah. So if you if you throw the two million dollars in there, then yeah, it's coming back to about zero. Well, I thought the the two million was coming from rainy day fund. Right. Yeah, but that's right. included in the ninety. Yeah. Oh, that's that's also included in the ninety five million. Yeah, because it's a transfer over to the general fund, so that it increased spending. We put all the spending in the general fund. So if you put back out that two million dollars. So in, an, in a more normal year where we had food and beverage revenue, um, that I, I'm trying to understand and now food and beverage revenue, it can only be spent of course on the convention center expansion. Right. So I, mean, you're, I don't you're, really count that as it, part it's of a little our- different. It's a little managers. difficult from, from year to year, you know, on the, on the overall total budget because some funds come into play one year and not the next. So in this case, food and beverage didn't, we didn't appropriate any money. We're getting revenues in, but because there's a pause to the expansion of the convention center, we didn't appropriate any additional money out of those funds. So that budget last year was an appropriation of $5 million and it's a zero line this year. So there was a $5 million decrease in the actual overall request uh, on, on the total budget obviously others increased because the net impact was three and a half million dollars. Well, $2 million was from the rainy day fund. So the general fund went up uh, another $2 million. So all in all, the, the bottom line of the total budget and the general fund budget is, it was pretty much break even. We tried to hold the line as much as we could in all of them. And in some cases it was a matter of funding. We just 
you're not getting the funding, the street department uh, was a perfect example that we had to cut over a million dollars out of that budget to make it fit within the revenue stream and cash balance that we had. And that's something that I, that I should have mentioned at the very beginning. Under Indiana Constitution, you have to present a budget, a, a balanced budget. Now, that's a combination of cash and revenue. So if your expenditures are $1 million, you have to have at least $1 million of revenues and unencumbered cash that you can use to fund that budget. So uh, that, that's how we were able to do that this year to present a balanced budget was we're using funds out of the uh, general fund itself to the tune of about $1.3 million and $2 million out of the, the rainy day fund to make that budget balance. Mm -hmm. So to make up for the, the motor vehicle highway fund. Right. Shortfalls and to make some investments and recover. Forward. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any final comments for, or excuse me, any final questions before we go to public comment? Seeing none, I'll go to, to Clerk Bolden. I see a couple raised hands and particularly to the public, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are still with us, I know this is a long meeting uh, and it means a great deal that you're willing to stay with us and offer your thoughts. So, Clerk Bolden. Okay, uh, the first hand I see is Jerry Hayes. Mr. Hayes, if you'd like to go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll have to start by saying I'm a little disappointed to learn from an earlier public comment that line items can only be reduced at this point and not increased. That's what that was news to me. So it may make my comments moot, but I'm going to give them anyway. I've waited this long. Um, in uh, late 2016 or early 2017, Mayor Hamilton commissioned the Downtown Safety, Civility, and Justice Task Force. That task force uh, was comprised of um, Bill Beggs, he's an attorney with Bunger and Robertson, Talisha Kopic, Downtown Bloomington, Inc., Forrest Gilmore, Shalom Center, Donald Griffin, Jr., Griffin & Associates, Linda Grove Paul, Centerstone, Wendy Hernandez, IU Health, Bloomington Hospital, Barry Lesso, uh, United Way of Monroe County, Randy Lord, T.M. Crowley, Susan Riney, I guess Rennie, or I'm sorry, I may have mispronounced that, Life Design, and Kirk White with Indiana University. In their uh, report dated June 2017, uh, they stated, and I quote, many factors go into determining the number of police officers needed in a city, analysis of an agency's current and projected future workloads, population size, examination of 911 calls, comparison to agencies in comparable sit size cities, to name a few. At 100 sworn officers when fully staffed, BPD staffing has not seemed to keep pace with the growing need in the community. The department consistently ranks lower per capita in officers than similar Big Ten cities and similar sized cities in Indiana. The task force recognizes that many of our recommendations require additional community resources that currently may or may not be available. To that end, we strongly recommend that the city of Bloomington adopt a plan to adequately staff and support public safety initiatives, specifically including police officers at a level found in similar communities. According to, uh, and that's in the quote there, According to the 2018 FBI Uniform Crime Report, Wilmington has one of the lowest number of officers per thousand citizens. Other college towns in Indiana, South Bend is 2.3 officers per thousand, Lafayette is 1.9, and Muncie is 1.5, while Bloomington was 1.1. To put that into perspective, and, uh, currently I think we have According to the website, police department website, we have 103 sworn officers and an approximate population of 85,000. So that puts us at about 1.2 currently. To put that in perspective, if we were to increase that to 1.3, that would be 110 sworn officers. Vagrancy and violent crime seem to be increasing in Bloomington. Vagrants are becoming more aggressive, even to the point of attacking people downtown. 
We recently had two shootings within a 30 day period on the south side. And if you watch the nightly news, multiple murders occur every day in Indianapolis. We need a robust public safety policy and a strong police presence to present a similar, to prevent a similar increase in violence in Bloomington. Public safety is a cornerstone for making Bloomington a vibrant, safe place to live, work, and play. And I appreciate all the police department does with the limited resources available to them. Please keep Bloomington safe and support funding for Bloomington Police Department that's adequate to number one, pay a competitive wage to retain the officers we have, two, hire additional sworn officers to get us to a level found in similar communities as recommended by the task force, and three, provide training to ensure everyone is treated equally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. And again, thank you for staying with us so late. So, Ms. Bolden, are there additional comments? Um, yes, I have a comment from Dave Askins with the B-Square Beacon. Thank and you. Mr. Askins, do you want to read this or is it in chat? It's in the chat. I, okay. I think he has difficulty connecting. So give me just a second. I'm going to um, read it. Okay, from Dave Askins with the B-Square Beacon. If the city council voted down this 2021 budget appropriation ordinance, then as I understand it under Indiana code, here's what would happen. Quote, the most recent annual appropriations and annual tax levy are continued for the ensuing budget year, end quote. If we confine our attention to just the general fund, it looks like that would mean foregoing $907,547 worth of property tax levy for 2021. Question, does the growth quotient next year apply to the actual levy from the previous year, or does it apply to theoretical maximum levy? That is, would we be foregoing the nearly $1 million of general fund levy just in 2021, or would we effectively be foregoing another $1 million in 2022 and every year into the future. I have a second set of questions regarding the difference between the salary ordinance and this appropriation ordinance. My understanding is that voting down the salary ordinance does not have the same impact as voting down the appropriation ordinance. The salary ordinance wouldn't carry over from last year, would it? That is, if six council members voted no on the salary ordinance on October 14th, like they did tonight, wouldn't that mean that no employee covered by the salary ordinance can get paid in 2021? Why can the city council not express its legislative will about things like departmental organization or the number of positions by just amending the salary ordinance as opposed to just voting it down? Specifically, what would stop the council from amending the salary ordinance to move TDM to the Planning and Transportation Department, as opposed to voting no on the whole ordinance. The salary ordinance doesn't change appropriations, so any statutory prohibition against touching those, pro those prohibitions don't seem like they would apply. And that is the full state question. Thank you. So are there additional individuals wanting, public, wanting to offer public comment? I do not see any other hands raised. Okay, let's give it another few seconds. And last call for public comment. And with that, let's come back to council or are there additional questions from council? I don't see any takers, I will jump in. Um, Mr. Underwood in particular, if you could comment, um, most of us have talked about it, but primarily for the benefit of the public at this point, could you comment on the implications of a no vote on October 14th? Um, Mr. Askins started to allude to this, but can you comment on what exactly that means and what happens? I will uh, speak to the fiscal side and, and uh, Corporation Council uh, 
Lopik Guthrie can talk about uh, some of the other aspects of it. Uh, all of the budgets would revert back. There would be uh, no changes to that. And the same for the levy. Uh, the, the, the other revenue streams we would continue to get. So uh, lit, public safety lit, and then all the miscellaneous stuff, we would get those. However, we would have to, if those exceeded budgets requests, uh, the administration would have the opportunity to come back in the next year uh, and ask for an additional appropriation that could only use cash that would not uh, change um, the levy. Uh, my understanding is we would have to make a, a special request to recover that lost levy that we would not automatically get it the next year because we would have adopted the, essentially the same levy as the year before. And we would have to show uh, the state uh, that we would need to recover that, uh, those funds. So, and that's a very difficult process. So it, it would be fairly difficult for us to ever get that back. And that's into perpetuity. Uh, the item of pay, uh, if employees are employed, they, they have to be paid. Now at what levels, um, you know, we would go back. I, th I think it would revert back to last year's uh, salary ordinance that you would continue on the salaries that had been approved. Uh, the, the adoption of another ordinance uh, might change those, but um, I'll let Philippa talk about the legal aspects of that, but you can't have people work and not pay them, that much I know, so. Uh, and just because this may inform Ms. Guthrie's response as well, um, and it's an extension of the same question, what would be the implications of voting yes on the civil city appropriation ordinance, but no on the ordinance 2023, which sets the salaries. So, and Ms. Guthrie. I don't know that I know the answer to that, actually. Okay. I will have to check. And I mean, I wanna... think it reverts as the budget does, but I don't know, I will have to, I'll have to research it. And anything in, in addition to Mr. Underwood's? No, Response? he covered what I would have said. Okay, thank you. Additional questions from council. Council member Piedmont Smith. So uh, the ordinance 2023, uh, it's an ordinance, it's not an appropriation ordinance. So I assume that we could uh, have pass an amendment to it. Um, so if we passed an amendment, theoretically, um, to uh, take money out of one department's, you know, take a position out of one department and put it into another department, um, would that, I mean, it would still be in the general fund, would that be uh, at a level of detail enough to contradict the app ORD? I don't believe so. Uh, we break it down by department as a courtesy. We're not required to do that. Many municipalities just have a, that just the listing of the employees and not by department. We break it down by department again for transparency's sake to see, you know, where, where are these positions planned for and how are they funded? Uh, I think if you amended the salary ordinance, uh, it wouldn't really have any impact on where the positions uh, stood and who it reported to, that, that's a personnel issue. Wait, it would have an impact on where the position stood if we amend only, the salary only, only from the salary ordinance standpoint. The funding would still remain in the department that it, that it was. Basically, the, it, we're showing you where the employees are in the department. It all rolls up into one appropriation ordinance and one salary ordinance. Now, I, I'll let, if, if, I, if I'm speaking out of turn, I'll let, uh, Philippa, jump in and tell me I'm wrong. I believe your authority is over the dollars, not necessarily um, the personnel decisions about who is where. That's that's my first instinct, but again, I will have to look at these issues. I don't know that they've come up. Well, they certainly haven't come up since I've been here. All right, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions?
And let's go, seeing none, let's go to final comment from council. Council member Rallo. I just wanted to comment on Mr. Hayes' uh, comment. I appreciate, I appreciate him staying uh, for the duration of this meeting. I, I just wanted to say that I do indeed support uh, the Bloomington Police Department. And I also support the investment required to, uh, to keep uh, our officers and, uh, and to expand the police force in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Council Member Sandberg and then Council Member Piedmont Smith. I also agree that we have some issues we need to take a very hard look at with the Bloomington Police Department. I've done my best to uh, work co cooperatively and um, uh, in, in tandem with the administration on how we can problem solve this and how we can meet their needs uh, that are going to help us stem the tide of the, um, the exodus that we are, we are experiencing. I will continue to do that regardless of what happens with this budget uh, by staying you know, in touch, uh, listening very, very carefully to um, the boots on the ground as it were. Um, uh, and uh, also with respect to the social worker issue, I have done social work myself in the past. I'm very mindful and well aware of the ethics involved with social work and it's a completely different career and it's a completely different set of work and principles from what police officers, sworn trained police officers do. What the BPD has done and what the city of Bloomington has done in our attempts to be progressive and to be innovative as we have tried to fill some gaps, some need gaps in this community by incorporating the neighborhood resource officers, the DROs, and now social workers into the BPD. It actually makes sense to me to have them there because this is all about responding to calls. And so having it with BPD, you're there with dispatch. And when calls come in, those can be determined. What are the calls that absolutely have to be done have to be answered by sworn officers and what could maybe be better served by a social worker who has a different set of skills and certainly is not trained to do the emergency work that an officer has to do. So it's been a cooperation and a coordination. Everybody knows what their role is and what their role isn't. And from what I can see from talking with these individuals who are in these jobs, there is supervision. There are staff who can advise uh, this, the new social work staff on, no, that's not a call you should go on, that there, there is some intrinsic danger there. So that's, that, that one's not for you. We absolutely need a sworn officer to go out on this one. That coordination, if the city of Bloomington is gonna be doing this at all, I think is essential to make this program work. If there is a criticism that we shouldn't even be in the business of adding social work, then all I would say is I would encourage nonprofit organizations that do social work uh, to step up and do that because my understanding from what CAHOOTS is in Eugene, Oregon, it's not th that city managing the program. It is a coordination between the city and the police and a nonprofit organization, but it is a very strong partnership. What that sounds like to me is what we now have with our stride center. So again, if it's not appropriate to have social workers with our BPD, by all means, let's move them to where they need to be in order to respond in an appropriate fashion and then let the Bloomington Police Department get back to what they do, what they're trained to do and what they need to be supported to do and do well and to do safely. So that's my opinion on that. I will continue to have it. I will continue to work it, but I'm certainly not gonna hold up a budget and vote no on the budget just because I'm a little bit displeased by our inability to get our staffing numbers up to where I think they need to be. I think uh, that is something we all need to think long and hard about, but um, I will want to continue to work with the public, with the community, with our administration and try our very best to work in, in a better collaborative manner so that we don't get to these standoffs when it comes to the budget, because this is a little bit unprecedented. So thank you very much. I think for the most part, it's a good budget. I think for the most part, we have been operating in extremely difficult times that have tried the patience of us all 
both nationally, statewide, locally. We've got a we've got a COVID crisis, and we're facing an economic downturn. So we need to keep our heads about us. We need to work smart in, in a smart fashion, and we need to work in a more collaborative fashion. I'm hoping we can continue to do that in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Smith and then Council Member Bolin, I think. I thought I was after. Oh, Council I'm sorry. Sandberg, I'm sorry. Actually. I apologize. <laughs> Council Member Piedmont Smith. I was psyching myself up there. Several seconds have elapsed since I said that. So <laughs> please, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I appreciate Mr. Hayes' comments um, about the Downtown Safety and Civility Task Force. And, you know, it reminds me of um, uh, the budget hearings, you know, two years ago and last year, uh, especially two years ago when we had all of the, the, event, the business owners from Kirkwood Avenue come and tell us we need more police. Um, and I, you know, I think I was sympathetic to, to what they had to say at the time, and I probably supported uh, the increase in officers in those last two years. Um, and so people have asked me, you know, what, what has changed? Aren't you, you know, being hypocritical and suddenly saying we don't need more police officers? Well, um, I think what has changed for me as a white person is something that uh, Black people in in this in this country have have known for for decades and centuries is that that I have realized the systemic racism inherent in the police as an institution, and I'm not blaming uh, the Bloomington Police Department. I'm not blaming any individuals in the Bloomington Police Department, but the police as an institution in this country uh, were founded on racism and have in the last 20 years repeatedly gotten away with murder of African Americans. And it's uh, no wonder that people throughout this country, especially people of color, um, many of them do not trust the police anymore and would not call the police if there was a problem. Um, that's why I am looking for alternative solutions uh, like the CAHOOTS program, for um, situations in which there's a mental health crisis or uh, a drug misuse crisis or just an argument with a neighbor about mowing the lawn on Sunday morning. Um, because I think that uh, sometimes police, just by being there in uniform, in the, coming in the car, exacerbate a situation because it, 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 there is a feeling among many people of all colors that they may overreact that I'm, you know, I, I, I don't fully trust this institution, not this individual who I don't know and who may be wonderful, but the institution. And, and it has been tarnished throughout this country and Bloomington is not some golden exception. Yes, we have enacted many good reforms and excellent trainings and we are a good police department, but we are not exempt from what is happening across this country. And so <clears throat> this budget represents a very small and modest shift and recognition that sworn officers are not always the best uh, people to respond to emergency situations. <clears throat> by only moving five officers, five positions from sworn officers to more social worker type uh, social assistance workers and a data analyst, which also is very important. Um, I think we are going in the right direction. And it's not that, um, you know, suddenly things changed since last year. It's that I've realized it. <laughs> um, and, you know, even, even two years ago when we had the, the, the trouble on Kirkwood Avenue and, and all of the police, you know, move people out of People's Park, did that solve anything? That solved nothing. That just moved uh, transit people 
to Seminary Square Park and to District 5. And you know, it didn't, it didn't get at the root problems. And we really need to reevaluate public safety and say, what are the root problems here? And they are homelessness, they are drug addiction, they are lack of mental health care. And so in the long term, we need to address those problems. I'm not saying that we can do that today or that city council can solve all these things, but more police, I don't think are the answer to these problems. <clears throat> so I support the mayor's move with this budget to change uh, five sworn officer positions to non-sworn positions. I do worry that there are social workers uh, reporting to law enforcement. I don't think that's the most appropriate role for social workers. Um, but I think uh, we can hopefully address that in the coming year and not get in the rut and say, they're there now and they have to stay there. I think we have heard from the mayor that there's some flexibility in the future with those particular positions. I've also heard from the mayor and have been working myself with some colleagues on having a, uh, a group of uh, a commissioner a committee from the public um, with far reaching representation uh, from demographic groups that are often uh, mistreated by authority, uh, figures of authority and don't often have a voice um, to ask them to contribute to this conversation on public safety. People who are homeless, people who have drug addiction problems, people who um, uh, ha are marginalized in other ways uh, due to their racial or ethnic background, um, due to mental health issues. Um, we need a, a broad swath of the community to come to the table and discuss uh, the future of public safety and how to improve public safety for everybody uh, in our community. And it may not be through the police. There may be other better ways to do this. And so I very much hope um, and will work towards having that commission active and, so, and prepared to make recommendations to us as a body and to the mayor uh, for the budget for 2022. So um, at this point, uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna vote tonight um, because I, there are some problems with the budget as I've mentioned before. I think the TDM position should really be in planning and transportation. Um, but I just on this essential issue of the police, we need to recognize and the Bloomington police like all police departments need to grapple with the reality that there has been a fundamental uh, breaking of trust. And it has largely been caused by police in other parts of the United States. And, it, and we are not exempt from that here and we need to recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Oh, Council Member Smith, I think was next. Oh, thank you. So I, what strikes me is um, I'll, be su I'll be supporting this budget overall. Uh, but what strikes me overall is we all uh, have voiced various dissatisfaction with different parts of the budget. And it seems like it's, it's the process and the collaborative nature of it just somehow isn't there. I think a lot of our issues, we might have been able to work through some of them earlier um, before the budget was presented to us. And I, I, I kind of think it would have resulted in a better budget. Not that it's a terrible budget, don't, that's not what I mean, but um, we all have ideas on how to refine it and that we could have uh, solicited some uh, feedback from our constituents, from Chamber of Commerce, just, just uh, the whole environment that we exist in. And I'd like to see us move, you know, in the future towards more collaborative budget with 
the city council as an institution being a stronger partner. And um, so that that's really what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council member Boland. So I got hot headed earlier tonight because I didn't see coming the admission that uh, transportation is being decentralized in the Hamilton administration, that it intends to remove it from the title of the planning and transportation department. And that we found out only from explicit questioning tonight. It's rare that I'm genuinely surprised by something I hear in a budget meeting like this. The mayor says he has listened and worked with and taken seriously the input of council. If so, he should have had no compunction about announcing his intention about transportation as policy initiative. There should be no reason under the logic of his uh, uh, silos argument in uh, our answers to budget questions to consolidate parking services in one division and public works under a director. Why not leave it spread among several departments as parking has been for many years, if that's so desirable? Uh, despite the existence of the TDM plan, the administration in my eyes is decreasing and defocusing from transportation going forward, doing little more than accommodating public transit, bike and pet infrastructure as part of a smorgasbord of other initiatives. It doesn't matter apparently where functions are housed in the city because, and I quote, the administration does not view any of our departments as silos. All are part of a larger organization under the direction of the mayor, unquote. Uh, it shouldn't matter then what departments we have or that new ones require approval by the council. I wanna refer the mayor to Indiana code 36494. The executive needs permission from the legislative body to create or terminate executive departments and their administrative functions. The mayor should not assume that he can have us agree to create a department and then change its name and mission at will. It does make a difference where functions are housed, doesn't it? Because I really think otherwise we should have a department of fire, information technology, parks and recreation. And I'm looking forward to forming that department with support of my colleagues on council. Uh, seriously though, and more importantly, I think the mayor should no longer assume that vague statements like we have worked with council are sufficient. I've made my primary concern clear, but across the board, there are concerns by a majority of members on a variety of topics. That a majority has even thought about voting no on the budget should give him pause, but it does not seem to have. Uh, this year, it's been a sobering education for me to learn just how limiting state law makes council authority over the act of appropriating money. What most council members are becoming concerned with, to my mind, is the very budget process itself and the authority over legislation that council delegated long ago before any of us took office to the administration, especially on appropriation matters. I think that uh, uh, the administration needs to rethink the way that it approaches working with council because that term uh, no longer means anything to me. I'll be voting no on this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Call the question. Actually, I'll finish up if there are no, I want to give everybody ample chance to do this. Um, so I'll close out with some comments of my own here. Um, one of the terms that's been used informally uh, a little bit in this meeting, I think, but, but elsewhere is the notion of a nuclear option. Um, the decision, a vote by council not to adopt um, the budget that is proposed by the mayor. And I, I don't mean to speak for my colleagues, but, but let's just say I'm pretty confident that none of us ever want to get to that position. We would prefer additional collaboration and genuine collaboration up front um, to be able to do that. Uh, I also I appreciate Mr. Underwood and Ms. Guthrie um, laying out some of the implications of what a no vote could mean. And um, 
I want them to hear, I want the administration to hear that I take that very seriously. Um, the notion of not passing about not passing ordinances that allow for the, the increase in raise, the raises that we've discussed all this time. Uh, and that's gonna affect hundreds and hundreds of our employees. I take that very seriously. And that's not a place I want to be. That said, I think there are some real concerns here. We've talked about uh, the two largest discussion themes tonight. One focused on the transportation demand management position and where it's located. Um, I confess that I don't have strong feelings myself, but I take very seriously the expertise and the insights of my colleagues on this council um, who, are, who know a great deal about this field and I can't ignore their comments. I think they're quite telling. Um, what I care very deeply about is the discussion we're having about BPD. Um, I want to applaud and, and promote and encourage a continued multidisciplinary approach, um, a multidimensional approach to the social challenge as we fear. Um, I believe policing has its place. And I also believe that our social service agencies play a critical role and that we have a formidable social services network here in Bloomington. Um, I really do want to applaud the mayor's decision to expand the number of social workers at BPD. I think that is an excellent decision. Um, and I believe it will make the department better. What I question is the wisdom of cannibalizing sworn officer positions to do it. And I have very serious reservations about that. Um, I think given all the discussion we've heard about TDM tonight and about policing tonight, um, I think there is still some work to be done on this budget and some conversations that need to be had. Uh, I think it's very reasonable to expect some um, additional discussions and possibly some amendments to come forward. Um, and I look forward to being part of those conversations. So uh, I will actually be passing tonight until some of those conversations unfold. So any additional comment? May I hear move to pass? Move to recommend pass. you pass. Second. Thank you. Or recommend you pass. Thank you. Um, Clerk Bolden, will you please call the roll for us? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Scambalori? Pass. Rosenbarger? No. Sims? Yes. Volan? No. Piedmont Smith? Pass. And Flaherty? No. That's 432. Thank you for that. Um, just a reminder for the public too, what, what we've done tonight are non-binding votes, but they do give an indication uh, of council's response to what's been presented to us. Um, the final adoption vote for the budget is planned for Wednesday, October 14th. Uh, and with that, if there are no objections, I'll call for adjournment. So moved. Second, third. Very well. Thank you everybody, particular thanks to the members of the public who've been with us this evening. So good night, everyone. <laughs>